welcome to our homepage. Oh, but it is animating. <laughs> well, welcome to our homepage. Uh, I'm Catherine Lequinas. I'm the social marketing manager at Digital Continue. I played a lot of Neo Pets as a kid, and now I'm moderating. Uh, why don't you all introduce yourselves and tell me more about where you all hung out on the internet, what you do now? Go start with Cal there. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yay. <laughs> um, um, I'm Cal. Uh, I make a game called Calico. It's a magical girl cat cafe sim. Um, we're showing on uh, Saturday and Sunday at the Indie Mini Booth. And um, I play a lot. I, I grew up on Guy Online and Neil Pets. Um, did not play Hobo Hotel, but all my friends did. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, kind of started everything there. Hi, uh, I'm Ashley Alisea. I am a games evangelist at Unity Technologies. So basically, I'm just like a professional Unity developer nerd. Um, I spend my days making a lot of games uh, or cinematic content to show off how Unity's new tools are used and made. And um, I kind of ended up in this role because of my very young obsession with being really just a little internet gremlin on sites like Two Grounds, I'll buy the black sheet, uh, <laughs> doing early like kind of PC mod stuff, and so that's uh, why I'm here today. <laughs> oh, hi, I'm Anya. Uh, I'm the director of games at Kickstarter. Um, I I have a weird history in games in the sense that they were banned in my house. Uh, also, cartoons were banned, funnily enough, and I worked for Nickelodeon for a long time, so it was like, sorry, mom. <laughs> like all cartoons? Uh, we could watch like some Disney. Okay. But like most points of reference for cartoons from the 80s and 90s, I'm like, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, but uh, my first job in games was managing addictinggames.com. I was the developer relations person, so I helped find the games that populated the site. So I'm sorry for all the time that you all have wasted. <laughs> so many hours, yeah. Um, and then before that, um, I played just like a criminal amount of Bejeweled. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Victoria. I'm the communications director at Kickbox Games. We're making a bunch of different things. Um, our most well known one so far, probably, is Boyfriend Dungeon, which is a dating simulator. Colorado, thank you. Um, and yeah, so before I spent a lot of time on places like Neopets, Have a Hotel, I was on that. Um, and honestly, getting like I was like 12 and I was getting like boyfriends because I didn't know really what that was. And they're like, I'll give you stuff if you're my girlfriend online. I was like, okay. <laughs> 16 female California. That is not what I was. Um, so that was weird. Uh, but yeah, so that was kind of my life. And I didn't have any console. Like consoles growing up because I wasn't allowed to have it, so I spent a lot of time playing flash games, like on addictinggames.com. So I met Anya for the first time, I was like, oh my god, it's my god. Flash games meet up and I was like, these people are real? And we're all monsters. Hi everyone, I'm Justine. I am an art director and lead artist at an indie studio in New York City. We haven't made anything you probably heard of, but it's fine. I grew up probably using Neopets the most, but I was also a really big role player, so I played a lot on like Acorn Rack and Avid Gamers and all those like customizable like role play sites a lot. Um, and I also played a lot, embarrassingly enough, a lot of Forcadia, uh, which was like a furry role play community, but there was like a lot of really cool like pixel art and things like that on that community. Uh, so I spent a lot of time on there and that's, yeah, that's kind of how I started getting into stuff because I also didn't have consoles growing up and couldn't afford them, so I just made friends strategically who happened to have a Game Boy. Um, and I kind of went overboard now because I own like every console, so it's like revenge. <laughs> awesome. I'm going to change the slides so that everyone's eyes don't burn. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sandy, do any of you have like any funny stories from using these sites that you spent so much time on when you were younger? Uh, do you guys want to hear a dark story about Hava Hotel? Oh. Sure! <laughs> <laughs> uh, trigger warning, it's dark. It's oh. real dark. How dark is it? It's pretty dark. Maybe I won't tell it. Okay. <laughs> 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 no, I can't tell it. Okay, okay, cool. It's, 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 it's bad. I'll tell, I'll tell people outside. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I just realized there's children in this audience. I can't do I can't tell you. Okay. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I guess, um... Uh, uh, Guy Online was pretty funny because, I mean, my entire, like, high school friend group was on there. And I also had, like, ten boyfriends on there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's pretty funny because uh, I learned how to type 
with Guy Online. Uh, I used to use, I mean, actually, the funnier thing is I'm back to how I used to type, but <laughs> it would be like lowercase i's, no formatting, everything spelled wrong, and I used to role play a lot on Guy Online, like huge role plays where you, uh, it's very organized, the person who runs it, they always update it with like the picture of the person's role play character and their bio, and then it goes for 200 pages in three years. Uh, and through that, people were like, you need to start capitalizing I and <laughs> writing correctly. So I started learning how to like type correctly and write like really long paragraphs and like with the correct syntax and everything. And, awesome. and uh, the funnier part is now I'm on Twitter and I'm back to before. Yeah, I remember spending a lot of time on the input to make me like very good at typing very fast. <laughs> so I feel that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the first time I ever just, so a lot of the games I used to play was like all acting games. I was like, oh, it'd be really cool to have like some storytelling game. And the first kind of like story-ish kind of telling game where you could like build relationships with people, I discovered on Newgrounds as a dating sim, but it wasn't a safe for work dating sim. <laughs> and I was a kid and I was just like, oh my gosh, why are they suddenly naked? Oh, well, okay. <laughs> um, I still want to play though because like there's no other game like this that I've ever seen before. Uh, yeah. So I kept playing them and my like brother who's like a few years older than me walks by and like, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, like 10, right? Like, I'm too oh young God. to be playing these games. And he's just like, what do I do? <laughs> you know, he just, he just decided to ignore me apparently. But then he was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call him on this. He was like, maybe I should go on new That was like the first foray though into like not safe for work content, I think. Yeah. And that was like, it was like the secret section of the website where it was like all these dating sims and hentai games. And you're like, I probably shouldn't look at this as a child, but like, it's fine. 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 It's Oh, I remember when I would just go on forums and people would just send me software to download so I can make art and I would just download it. I, I don't know how I survived. <laughs> um, that, that, it, things were so risky back then, but, mm -hmm. but we, we made out okay. Probably. Yeah, I, I found that with that virus. Yeah, I think we put like a name to it really recently, but I was a troll and I didn't know that trolls were a thing until now. <laughs> and I was like, oh no. What did you do exactly? Oh, because I got my account frozen. And I was wow. so sad. <laughs> What did I do? Because there was like a group that we were in. There's like a, it was like labeled FC. And I don't remember what it was. It was like the random board. It was just like there was no content. It was like people, and we would do like raids on other forums. Oh my God. And I think like we got, I got frozen because we did that. Like we went and just like spam through the thing. And like now that I'm older, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I know those people. Like what kind of stuff did you do with the raids? It wasn't like anything bad. It was just like spamming and like harassing people. I guess. <laughs> 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 oh my God.
some beta pets and all these other knockoffs of Neopets. And it was like the first time I discovered that like I could sell my art. Because um, I used to just doodle, like I, was, I wasn't very good at art when I was younger. And it was awesome because I got my first tablet. And then you made like things called adoptables, which are basically just line art. You would draw like the species. And then people would come to you and say, here's my purple one, can you make it purple? And you would just like fill in the colors and like fill all the stuff. And like people, I learned things that people gave you like currency for it. And I was like, oh, like I can actually do this. <laughs> like I can actually like make money off my art. And like when I first started, it was just like in-game currency. So you wouldn't get like $10, but you'd get like 100 points. And you just use those to sell stuff and get better things in the game. Um, and then as I got older, I realized that I could actually do that for real people money once I like, understood the bank account and stuff like that. So um, it was really awesome. And I actually like still kind of do it sometimes now. Um, a friend of mine was in town and we met on Embarrassing Furry Game. Um, and she's actually like a prolific tattoo artist now. We got like to chat and talk to each other and like we remembered everything. We're like, yeah, you know, it's like the best platform to kind of learn that I could monetize art and people were very interested in art their characters, of their OCs, and we're kind of seeing a huge resurgence of it now with like DD characters. Like people are commissioning people to do their hair for them. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of tied into all of that from when I was like 12 to now. I'm like, oh, this is still relevant. This is still a thing that people are investing in. Uh, I feel like I can tie basically every single game that skill I have back to <laughs> back to the early 2000s web. Like um, the first game I ever made was a choose your own adventure game. So um, Neopets actually implemented this thing where you could create a choose your own adventure game. Yes. And, yeah, it was like you could create branching and it would come up with a picture and, and words. And I made a story about a, um, a milk painted cow. <laughs> Like the K A W, <laughs> it was like this, this like scary like little goosebumps esque game, and oh I I've been trying to find it for like five years. I hope you find it. I want to see this. That's awesome. I I was talking before the panel started about how I lost my Neil Pets account, but now I have a tip on how to get it back. And if I get it back, I will post that. <laughs> but um, every other thing like uh, we used to go to the public library to play um, Albion Black Sheep games. And those were the first indie games I ever saw, and pretty much the first indie games that were around. And mm -hmm. That was a really big thing in telling me that like people could make games that wasn't just the CEO of Nintendo. <laughs> in my head, I was like, uh, I played games since I was two. Like my, my dad brought me up making games, and I didn't believe that I could make games because I was like, I'll never be hired by a big AAA. That or I couldn't become the CEO to make the story, even though now you don't have to be. But yeah, I mean, pretty much everything was from both Neopets and Guy Online. And I was the same way I did. Um, I did uh, commissions on Guy Online for drawing people's avatars, and that's how I made the big bucks on Guy Online. <laughs> eventually, like, crawled up the ladder of the class system, and does, was able does to Guy Online have a class system? <laughs> 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 um, I was also saying before the panel started, uh, Guy Online's still around, and oh, they had to adjust for inflation. <laughs> so they made, I think it's like a million gold equals one platinum, possibly, and anyway, I have a lot of fun. That sounds like a lot. Of <laughs> yeah, it's still awesome because like like we met, we were talking about, I, I just joined a Discord of a bunch of people and I'm still an avid role player, like it's, it's so fun for me, and I just recently discovered like a group of friends, and they were like, yeah, we all met each other on Gaia. I was like, what? Like, what year is it? Like, you still use Gaia? They're like, yeah, it's a huge wall play community still. Like, there's still tons of people there that are still doing exactly what we were doing 10 years ago, and it still works, but I checked their website, and it still looks like it's from the 90s. And I'm like, <laughs> are y'all still using this? Like, you okay? Like, there's so many different people, I don't know, that I was like, if it works, I guess, but I guess you have your avatar, and you're gonna tie, tie things to it, which you can't really do on the website. Um, but, like, just piggybacking off of that, too, like, having all those role play communities, and, like, it's really big to make them look good. Like, you have to skin your forums and do all these things and make them look really nice, and those things are still relevant now. Like, I'm still able to, like, change things and adjust things and use code because of those role-play websites, but, yeah. And, like, kind of like what you guys are mentioning about doing commissions. Y'all were smart. I I didn't try, I did commissions, I didn't charge anything. No. <laughs> but I did, I, I'm not an artist at all, but I did do um, different like HTML lookups and pages and I would just share them with people and we would share them on forums. And since I didn't really have the means to like buy anything myself, I just then just share my name with others. And uh, it for me, it's like the 
being able to show code like that, really I was thinking no one is ever going to pay for HTML5 skills ever. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I, I kind of fell off of doing the HTML5 uh, things that I didn't think I would ever use it again in my life. Um, and because I was on Newgrounds and Albino Black Sheep, I started learning Flash development and started learning, you know, um, asking questions on forums or following like little tutorials here and there and making like my first little Flash games and Flash creations. And I use them to tackle like really serious topics like bananas and pop culture. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, but through that, I, I learned Flash and, and kind of like what you were saying, like that's when I learned. I'm like, okay, wait, like you know, people are are, are making really cool games with this. And then you know, bigger games started to appear on places like Newgrounds, like uh, like Binding of Isaac, you know, more longer form, not like a quick five minute Flash game. Um, and those skills, uh, like that's what led me to kind of learn game development. And the first thing I decided to learn was HTML5 games because I already knew all of the HTML code from Neopets and from MySpace profiles and all that. So yeah, a lot of that stuff still leads over now. What was your favorite of the, the Flash games that you made? They were so bad, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go down that road. Um, really, a, a lot of it was like, I would try to make my own like doll makers. Y'all remember dolls and like yeah. everywhere and like, I would try to make my own and like in my own weird styles. Like I made, oh my God, I, mean, I know I'm gonna regret this later. I made a, a like a little flash game uh, with the band members of My Chemical Romance. <laughs> 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 Just like setting them up itself, and like, how was that kid? And uh, I still am, no. though. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, I'm so happy. Um, but no, the, uh, but yeah, it was, it was a weird time. Oh, that's awesome. I think this is where me being uh, a bit older comes into play. <laughs> uh, just in the sense of like, in terms of like transferable skills for work, right? So like, I started at Addicting Games when I was 25. Um, yeah, and I like didn't really play flat. Like I was just, I was very much a casual sort of player of games. I didn't even, I don't think I realized I was like playing flash games, right? Like I was just like, oh yeah, this is a game on the internet that I like because going to college in like 2001 to whenever I left, <laughs> don't graduate. <please. laughs> I mean, graduate, I don't know. Uh, I like tried to play console games. I like wanted to play video games and everyone that I played with, they were like, no, you're a girl, you're not a so I was just like, all right, I'll, I'll just figure this out on my own, I guess. And so I just started playing like little online games. But in terms of transferable skills from getting sort of deeply involved in addicting games, even though it was like that's what I was being paid to do, mm -hmm. um, I have a whole like Rolodex of creators that I work with. And it also sort of made me sympathetic to like the art per mentality, right? So like my big thing is I don't, I don't believe that game developers are game creators or game developers are creators. So like people who make games are artists and they should be treated as such. Um, and so working on Addicting Games just made me like really kind of like hone in on that a lot. Just be like, great, everyone should be treated like an artist. You're putting some emotional labor into the thing that you're creating, and that's how it should be treated. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I feel like everyone had such like cool skills like drawing and HTML, and I was not that kid. I was like, screw <laughs> any of that. I just want to talk to people online. And again, get the boyfriends, which I still don't understand, <laughs> to give me stuff. <laughs> I was, it, look, it blew my mind that people were like willing to do this. I was like, what is going on? Why are people doing this? <laughs> again, I'm like a kid, I, and I have no concept of what a boyfriend is. Um, so so who gives you free stuff on Yeah, you? that's the end of it. You get free stuff Wait, on you? Victoria, no. is this where you tell us that you've been a catfish this entire time? Oh, <laughs> 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 friends online, have a community, and 
understand kind of the social dynamics that comes with that. And honestly, like I think so much of my job now is because I had that baseline, like, oh, I put in the effort to talk to people online, I understand how it is, um, and I know how to communicate online. And it doesn't tire me out anymore because I understand it and I feel like very connected to it because you know when you're sometimes you're lonely and the people online are the people that you really connect with and yeah I think that's yeah I have a similar experience to that too it's like so oh you're a catfish too oh no no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes I have two catfish on the internet no like I remember Neopets is like probably the first online community that I was like part of and stuff because it was like the family friendly ones so mm -hmm. I was just able to get on it whenever I wanted yeah, there are so many interesting spaces, like, it's a slight tangent, but the idea of, like, the internet vernacular, right? Like, how you communicate with people and how you talk to people, and I think, like, learning how to do that was really important, and, like, Twitter, like, Twitter language is totally different than, like, human language, and you start to get all these, like, different, different ways of, like, interacting with folks, but especially with games now, where so much of games is online, those skills, even just being able to talk to people and infer what people need from tone is, like, so important, because, like, you didn't realize that you were doing that when you were younger, like, with AIM and all these different chat rooms and stuff. Um, and it really taught like a lot of communication skills that you didn't even think about because you had this stranger on the internet, right? And your mom's like, don't meet those people, they could be murderers. And now that's all we do. Like, we get to a, a stranger's car through the internet, and like, that's just what we do now. So it's really interesting to kind of see like how those things have changed. Um, my best friend, I live with my best friend, and I met them on the same furry game, and now we're best friends. And like, we've known each other for 13, 14 years, and you don't realize like, these are the people that you hold on to for a really long time. Um, and it's so cool to see those friendships now. And of course, you know, the languages have changed, right? We're not talking on like, you know, that's or, you know, any kind of role boards, but you still have those connections through Twitter and all these different places, and it's led me to some really cool people. <laughs> so it's really awesome to see that still working. Yeah, me too. Um, I think it's sort of a continuation of the, the last question. We sort of touched upon some of this already, but like, uh, which of like these specific skills have you found like the most useful in your day-to-day -day work? Like what you're currently doing. Mm. That's a good one, I think, that, that I didn't think I would, uh, would learn. But back, like earlier in the internet, searching for stuff was a pain. You know, Google was baddy and like it, it, everything was like, you know, maybe you had a couple different search engines like Yahoo and SGs and stuff. Um, and being crafty and resourceful and really digging and searching for resources that I would use as a developer um, mattered a lot back then. And it still matters now, even though it is easier to find different resources because. Um, Thank you, search engines. Uh, but the uh, it's that's one thing that like and also like aside from you know being a game developer, I organize a lot of uh, indie community events and developer meetups and stuff. And running events, especially on a super low budget, you have to be resourceful as hell. Uh, and so really um, being able to search around, get in touch with the right people, be in the right forums, or or tw and now it's like you know the you know Twitter and Discord and all these things. So a lot of the, a lot of that kind of digging for info skills. I think for me it's listening. Oh, that's a good one, yeah. Yeah, like, I don't, I don't, and I don't mean that in the sense of like, just active listening, but like, really hearing what the person is saying, because we say a lot in the things that we don't say, right? Like, there's a lot of context that's kind of given where it's like, um, if you say, I feel this way, so, so for example, um, you're not listening to me, it's not that the person is not listening to you, what you're really saying is, I'm not being heard. And that's so different than you're not listening. So being able to kind of like contextualize that sometimes, especially in like an art space and a creative space where it's like, again, emotions are high and like work is high and just being able to kind of like dial things back and say, okay, I'm what I'm hearing versus what you said, right? Like that's antagonistic. And so kind of learning how to listen appropriately and, and actively listen, I think um, just through like, uh, for me at least, I did a few names, a lot of it was like uh, language barriers. A lot of like international people and having to like dissect emails that went through Google Translate. Oh wow! <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. okay. Um, at one point, someone was like, I want to get the check, and a donkey delivered it. And I was like, what? Did you ever find out what that meant? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Vicky meant a donkey delivered it. I hope we got there on time. Yeah. I was like, how are you coding? <laughs> um, but yeah, listening, really actively listening, and like internalizing and hearing what what people are saying has been like the most beneficial part. And it's it's an everyday practice that I'm kind of an expert in this, but yeah, it's a good one. Uh, I feel like I have a very specific like like line of how it helps my game dev. Like um I used to play doll dress up games constantly and what I'm doing like 
this month is making a character creator for my game. And <laughs> it, it's really, it really helps the whole time to practice that for five years. <laughs> yeah. Or 10 years or whatever. I never stopped playing, so I guess it's 20 years, but. but <laughs> um, yeah, and, and other things like, even with um, biz dev skills like communication, uh, being able to argue with people online for <laughs> a decade means that you get really, really good at, at talking with your remote workers via email. Because I mean, even my my publisher, um, all the systems and platforms that we're on, they're they're all not where I am. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure zero work actually that I do is in person. So uh, internet literacy is, is really really important, and I think it's it's really good that a lot of us have learned that because it makes communicating with the people you're working with so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mine I think would have to be like self-marketing, especially when you're an artist. There's so much, there's so many artists out there and they're all very good. And every day I go to work and I'm like, oh my God, everyone is way better than me. And that's just like a huge thing that art kind of struggles with. So like you always have to be actively marketing. You always have to be saying, you know, here's my skills, this is what I can do. You kind of have to find ways to stand out, right? Like if you have a whole forum of artists that are like, I'll draw your dog. You know, you have to make sure that you find that hook and you find kind of what people like to do. and. Um, it's, it's really relevant now because I'm starting like to do my own merchandise, which I've never done before. Like I've always done commissions, but I'm like, I want to do an artist happy. So I like started making a bunch of merchandise and I'm like, how do I make like my stuff stand out enough that people want to buy it, that they want to find these things. And like all these different websites and all the different formats that I've done art before from guild lookups to graphics to forum layouts and you know, it's always about standing out. And I think that it really taught me to focus on listening to people, seeing what people like, what the news trends, what are things that are doing popular, and finding those and holding onto those. Uh, so it's been really fun for me because it's taught me like how to navigate through that. And as like a side thing, as like I, um, we were talking about Club Penguin earlier. Yeah. I actually, one of my first like jobs out of mobile games was for an online kids game called Heratopia, which was like a, a competitor for Club Penguin. So we always just used to have to look at Club Penguin with their Disney budget and just be like, well, there's four of us in a room trying to make this. Um, but it was like my first direct thing where I was like, wow, like this is exactly the game that I would love to play when I was a kid. Um, so I had the cool opportunity to kind of work on that and it was really fun because I got to draw all the cool furniture that you put in your room and I was like, I can just make up things that I wanted. And it was really it was really fun to be the doll and be like, I'm living out like my kid fantasy right now, being able to make this for children. And whenever we got fan art of like the characters that I designed, I was like, oh my God, they were so cute. And I like someone hung up and it was a really, really cool experience for a while. And it, it literally like taught me what to do because I knew what kids did. I, you know, I looked at it from when I was a child, but it was really fun. That's awesome. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess if we're going, because obviously I learned like communication skills from it, but if I'm going to go for a very specific example, um, has anyone has people heard of Dwarf Fortress before? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, so we're publishing, if you don't know, it's just a, it's been a game that's been in development for like 16 years and it's constantly being updated, slowly, but being updated. Um, and it's a game we're also publishing. Um, and we, so yeah, we're publishing it for the developers on Steam and it's a game that, again, has been around for 16 years. Uh, so when we kind of brought it on, I was like, oh, um, it's interesting because the same kind of like love and like empathy I have for all the Flash games I used to play, like I'm talking to people who are still playing it basically. It's like a guy, it's like Door, Door Fortress is constantly being played still and there's still a huge community around it and they're so into it. And it's something where it feels like I can relate because I'm like, oh, this, at certain points in my life, like there's been a game that has helped me through something. And I, I've seen like Door Fortress be that for people and being able to talk to them about it and kind of hear their stories has been really nice and just, oh, I love them. I love, I love the portraits. Do you have any like very specific instances of that that you find really interesting? Not that I can like share because I feel like it goes through like personal life stuff. Oh, um, right, that's but yeah, but I, like I'll see people like post on like the Steam forums being like, someone tell like, Toby, who is the developer, like that he helped me like learn how to program because the game is so complicated and we're like, I learned how to program because of your game, because it was so fun. And I was like, oh, that's so good. Oh, that's it's just awesome. so, it's just so wholesome. I know. I love good stuff on the internet. <laughs> I think a really cool part about learning from your past when you're in the internet age is I don't have to like think about trying to remember how I felt when I was connecting with these things back then. I can go into my guy online secret journal <laughs> how I felt when I was 13. And, and Calico is, is also a game that's 
um, for all ages. So it helps a lot to remember who was I when I was a kid? Like, what did I like? How did I really feel? Because I think you really, really morph your, your memories in your head when you were a kid. So being able to actually go back and, and read what your interactions were and, and read how your feelings were at that time is really helpful. And I think that's, that's something that a lot of people that are older than us don't have. It's a really humbling, sorry, it's like a really humbling thing um, to like, Anya, you brought up GC, the little flash game speed up. And I got to meet someone who worked on a game that I loved a lot, and I had no idea, because like, you have the era of like flash games where like, okay, those people just do flash games, but now they're like developers, and they're still doing cool stuff, and they're still working on cool projects, and you meet them, and you're like, you have worked on that game? <laughs> like, I got so like, starry eyed, it was amazing, and I've actually met um, an art idol of mine, uh, I don't know if anyone ever played the game called Glitch, it was like an online game, yeah, you college, like Alec and I was in college, um, and it was crazy. And I actually met the artist who worked on it completely on accident, and like their company became Slack. Like they just made Slack because they were like, that's more profitable, so we're gonna shut the game down with Slack. Um, and I actually got to meet him, and he like sent me an art book, and he like signed it, and he put all the stuff in it, and it was like the coolest thing ever because it was the game that like I didn't know what I wanted to do in school. I had no idea what I wanted to do in college. Um, I went to school for film, um, and now I make games, so it was the one game that I played through all my classes and probably got in trouble for playing through all my classes, and it kind of made me want to do games. Um, so you get to meet all these people that were part of that culture, and you didn't even realize that, like, yeah, they're, obviously they're still people, and they're still making cool stuff, and it was cool to kind of see that come full circle. Yeah, I mean, Newgrounds was like a breeding ground for flash games that are becoming awesome games now, right? Like Binding of Isaac. Uh, I'm pretty sure Behemoth just said they're going to do like a new version of Alien Dominant. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, they, they actually were showing it on the airport. Yeah. Today. Yeah, that was a flash game, right? Like, obviously, Tom from from Behemoth, um, who, if you guys don't know, Tom Fulp, uh, he he runs, he is New Grounds. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> and so, and he's, you know, co owner of uh, Behemoth. But yeah, there's just countless, countless creators uh, who started, got their start in Flash, just making tiny little Flash games. Um, and now, oh, Kingdom Rush is a great example, too. Kingdom Rush is coming to Switch. Like, Wild to me. <laughs> well, if anyone wants to deep dive, yeah. flash game tower defense. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're all about that. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of those folks still seem to be like really close. With, like I have friends who go to like Pico Day and stuff every year, and they're like, yeah, it's so cool. I mean, I can tell you like from someone from like the business side or like the like running the site from the flash days. There's actually a flash panel that my friend John Clooney um, is putting together for tomorrow. Oh wow. Um, we're all going to deep dive in the flash days, but like we're all still very close. And I think also like the way that we as like essentially website owners, right? Like even though I didn't own addictinggames.com, but like I was the addicting games person, like everybody in that community kind of knew who I was. Um, we all communicated with each other. And I think that to a certain degree, since a lot of us are now either like I'm a Kickstarter, half of those, half of those guys, because they're all men, it's the only woman. <laughs> Weird. Uh, <laughs> shocker. Uh, they're now in publishing. We still all talk to each other, and that publishing community, they all talk to each other because we were like, it's cool if I don't get the game, but the game needs to be seen. So here, you know, Dan from Army, Army Games, here you go. Uh, was, like, we were all constantly communicating with each other, and we really kind of made an unconscious, unconscious effort to build that into what we wanted the indie space to be for console games. That's awesome. Cool. So, um, what are some other ways that people can get these sort of skill, skills and experiences that you all got, but today? Like for people who are interested in kind of deep diving into that now? Yeah, um, I would say a, a big one I'm seeing right now that reminds me of, of like doll making and, and doing doll pulls is Pit Crew. Yeah. Like, it's so amazing to see like all of these young artists like pick up the same exact kind of thing. And and Picru makes it really easy too. It, it's a Picru is, if you don't know, it's a um, website that has dress up games, but it has a very specific uh, outline for how you make those dress up games. And it has a system that you can input the images in and it, it just basically streams on streamlines the entire process in. It's really cool to it's do. So addicting. <laughs> <laughs> I've played probably like fifty. <laughs> it's also entirely in Japanese, so it kind of teaches you that like it's so intuitive that you don't need to speak Japanese to know how yeah, it works, which is awesome. Like, it's so cool to see that work that way. And yeah. local friendly, too, which is yeah. Cool. yeah, and then another one that I see a lot is actually people learning how to 3D animate using, um, uh, I know a couple of YouTube people that are actually, like, literally kids 
who animate all like TF2 sequences because they there's a public library of all the TF2 team purchase two um, uh, assets yeah. and 3D models and, and stuff, and then you can actually just move them around in, in your own editor. And then, uh, yeah, people make these incredible things and then they learn how to 3D animate and it's so cool. Technology's helped out a lot. Like I was gonna suggest mods. Like so many kids are making mods for games, which is nuts. Because like I just didn't have that technology when I was younger. I didn't have access to Blender or any programs to make 3D models. So I think like encouraging kids to do that, like Minecraft skins and all these different mods for games is really impressive. And you have young teens that are just making super talented, amazing things. Um, but yeah, so just like seeing kids able to like pick up 3D models, be able to just take stuff and put it in their games on PC is just crazy for me. Like all the Minecraft packs were just so cool when I was playing Minecraft. Like it's really impressive to see people sort of make these, and I, I think that's what's really cool about it, right? Is you know, they have so many more access to technology, so you can encourage people to really explore with, like, not even kids, just anybody, like, you can just pick up a program and start writing it. And I think there's so many resources thanks to search engines and thanks to these things that kind of make it almost a little bit easier because you have all these tools at your disposal to kind of learn and you can just make a game whenever you want, which to me is crazy. Like, I was like, oh, I can just make my own games. I didn't ever thought of that, you know, because you just, like, didn't have that technology when I was growing up. Like, you just didn't have access to it. So it's really cool to see that. Speaking of kids, like, oh my god, was I doing a Roblox? I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my, my niece, she is seven, and she is making games in Roblox. And at first I thought it was just another online game. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way her and her friends are actually like, setting up games together, and I remember stuff like this, like, in-game game making, like, with uh, games like Second Life and stuff. Like, I remember that that was a thing, but really, the technology has become, like, so accessible, as you said, and so uh, available. Uh, and usable by, by young folks. Um, I sh I'm sure many of us remember figuring out all that code stuff, and especially like Flash and Action Script when we were young, that was hard. But now it's really, really easy to make games. Uh, it's, it's amazing to see uh, not only them using things like Roblox, but then taking those skills from what they learned, uh, or for um, what they went through in pit group and stuff, and they moved on to more advanced tools. And, and this is something that I've, I've uh, you know, that was mentioned before, having access to like free resources matters a lot. And there's a lot of free resources available now as well. Uh, so you don't, there's not as many barriers to entry. So for example, uh, at, in regards to Unity, I'm seeing now uh, people go from, you know, uh, playing games on websites to then modding games and then moving on to something like Unity and creating their own version of a game. Like I know someone who is making, trying to remake Breath of the Wild in Unity. Uh, and so, and like, and, that's yeah. awesome. and it looks amazing. Uh, and, and there, and all of the, you know, the resources and the tools that you need to do it are, are free. And I think that's a big, really important part. Um, and I think that there are a lot of resources, not just, not just for like, uh, you know, game development uh, engines, right? But one thing I just have to mention right now, has anyone made Dreams? I've been seeing a lot of stuff from Dreams, and the stuff they're doing is like amazing. It, it's just like they're recreating like entire like high fidelity 3D models and stuff, and like it's video. incredible. Um, you know, my my partner is actually making his game in Dreams right now, and oh, wow. it's it's. I think that experiences like Dreams are like the new Neopets. It, it's it's a game, but you go in and you. It's so easy to use visual coding. You can even make like shaders super easily for your games really? and, and all sorts of different environments and animations and more. Um, I see people using it just for art. They're doing 2D art or 3D art. Um, and I think as more experiences like that are made to a very high quality level, they're no longer kind of like middleware tools or stuff like that. You know, big, formal, nice, easy to use experiences are going to be helping a lot of people do the same thing that we were doing 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, and the, the big thing is it's all this like, I mean, we're making our game all in free software, so Unity and, um, and Blender, and kids even just, once you open that software, then they learn it. Like, <laughs> the biggest thing is getting them to open it. So one thing that I see a lot is actually the tutorials I use for making um, a lot of things in Blender are 
uh, tutorials that they give to make assets in both The Sims uh, for mods and VR chat. Like there's so many, because a lot of those things involve taking assets that already exist, like the framework is there, the, the bones are there, and editing them slightly. And that is the perfect tutorial for when you need to learn very specific things, <laughs> how to turn this bone this specific way and what's the shortcut for this. Uh, yeah, they're all tutorials from that. And it's really cool to me that that means that there are kids who are gonna open Blender just to edit their VR chat thing. And then um, in VR chat you have models that you use to represent yourself and you can um, edit those. But they're full 3D models with armatures and like regular animations. And yeah, uh, once they are in that, I'm sure they're learning just at an extraordinarily rapid pace what took us a million years to learn. I would just add two quick things. Um, one, I think uh, when we're talking about specifically online communities, um, especially with kids, right? Like we want to be really careful about that. Um, but I think the cool thing is now there's so many online communities that are also transferable into real life communities, right? So Girls Make Games, I think is a great yeah, example. Yeah, they're awesome. Mm -hmm. Amazing, absolutely amazing. So being able, like, you know, having that opportunity of being like, I, I'm, I'm, you know, my kid is really young, or my niece is really young, or I have a, a young person in my life that's interested in coding, and they're maybe being discouraged because of their gender. Um, Girls Make Games is a great um, opportunity. There's also so many meetups, right? Like a meetup, I think, from like the 90s, if you're like, I'm gonna go meet up with a bunch of people from the internet, they'd be like, cool, you're dying. <laughs> <laughs> like that sort of mentality has shifted where it's like, pretty normal, right, that it's totally normalized. So doing a meetup of like coding, first time coders or first time artists or first time whatever it is in games that you wanna do, like having that opportunity to meet in real life is kind of invaluable. And the reason I say that is also, I don't think people realize how lonely game development is, especially if you're a solo dev. So even like a co-working space where you're able to kind of just like, you know, dump ideas on the people, it's super, super invaluable and there's so many more co-working spaces too. Um, the second thing I would say is accessibility to creators. Um, Flash games in particular, one of the things that people used to do at the end of the game, that like end game credits, was your email address. <laughs> Which is wild to think about now. Nobody gets my email. Actually, gets <laughs> no one gets my personal email. That ooh, that really. <laughs> Across. Don't take my personal email. <laughs> uh, but accessibility to creators to help you is really, really invaluable too, right? And so now instead of your email address, a lot of times people's Twitter handles will be put at the end of the game too, like the accessibility to a Twitter handle because Twitter is where all of us are. Right? Use Twitter yeah. to develop and yeah. you want to get to games. Like it's, every single game developer is on Twitter. Yeah. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible place and you feel like you're not on Twitter. But also, like, use Twitter. It's, it's bad. Also it's also good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like Twitter is essentially the new online community. Like, what sort of advice do you want everyone to walk away from this panel with, based on what we've talked about today? Take advantage of cool resources. There are so many out there, and especially if you're somebody who wants to make games, there are a hundred different ways to make it happen. Um, and it can feel really daunting, because you're like, I don't know what I want to do, this is a lot of stuff, but starting with a game jam, going to a meetup, uh, making twine games, any of these little things, like, really are awesome gateways. And there's so many different ways, like, Yes, it's about who you know, but there's so many cool ways to just make little experiences now, and there's nothing really stopping you from doing it. You don't have to be an artist, you don't have to be a programmer, like there's always a solution out there for whatever you like to do. Um, so definitely take advantage of the internet and take advantage of these cultures and these communities because they're gonna be the gateway for you to be able to make really cool stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think my, my biggest one would be like, don't, don't let like an unconventional way that you've educated yourself stop you from it let you have imposter imposter syndrome because mm -hmm. really like a lot of game devs have alternative ways that they've learned things mostly mostly because it's so new like I was a community manager before I did Calico and community management itself has only been around for like less than a decade and most people started like five years ago or less so stop thinking to yourself like oh I can't make a game or I can't work in games because I didn't go to school for games, because most people didn't. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, there's just, just so many ways to learn, like the littlest things that we did in Neopets and Guy Online, and to, to even more things that, like uh, 
looking up tutorials on YouTube and going through each and every step of the YouTube tutorials and learning how to use Blender. YouTube tutorials are like the best thing yeah. ever. <laughs> I made my wedding dress from a YouTube tutorial. No way, what? <laughs> That's awesome, good for you. Yeah. Going, going off of that, the, um, uh, the, I, have, I have two, two bits of advice. The first is think about what you love to do especially if you're good at it, and think about how that can be a career. Because, you know, I didn't go to school for game development either. I studied zoology. I worked with tarantulas. And, like, I, <laughs> and I switched them for computer bugs, which I like a lot better. Um, but the, uh, but it's, it never occurred to me. And I, I grew up, you know, um, in, in a very small town with very conservative parents. And, and they, game development wasn't an option for a career. Uh, you know, it was doctor, lawyer, you know, scientist, whatever. Um, it never once occurred to me that someone like me could make games, could get into games. I thought you had to be someone and like live in Japan and like make like a, you know a Nintendo or something to make a video game. But anyone can, and it's and it's so accessible, um, more than people realize. And kind of my, my second pro tip after, uh, in regards to that is there are so many scholarships and opportunities within the game industry to bring you to events like GDC, to to events like PAX. Um, there's different meetups, like, like Anya mentioned. There's so many different ways that you can get involved. And when I was younger, especially because I did not have a traditional background, I was like, I don't, I don't belong here. I don't, I don't relate to these people. I didn't study computer science. I, I don't know how to program a game from scratch right now in my life, you know? Um, it didn't matter. And that was, I think, one of my biggest regrets early on, my, early on in my career, to apply for those things, because now at Unity, I work on those programs, and I look for people, and I read the applications, and I accept people into these programs. And a lot of the people that I bring in don't have traditional backgrounds, have never made a game before, but everyone is welcome. And I think it's really important for people to know that because it's very easy for us to you know, tell ourselves, I'm not ready yet, or you know, but just go for it. If you want to make games, go for it. Look for opportunities. Try to go to events. There's, there's a lot out there. Yeah. I think for me, I think the biggest thing I've seen um, is people being afraid to start something or just not having the like, it takes a certain amount of energy to start something, right? So I'll talk to a lot of people who want to get into games and I'll be like, cool, what do you want to do? They're like, I want to be a writer. I was like, okay, what have you written? And they're like, oh, uh, nothing. And I was like, okay. So the first step is to write something, get something in twine, just write a story, do something. like. I want to get into community management. Okay, what are you doing? Like, like a marketing certificate to show you're serious, right? It's, it's just showing like that extra bit of energy that will help you. Um, and yeah, like I also didn't think I would start in games, and I didn't have Twitter, and I thought Twitter was dying, so I was like, I don't need a Twitter account. I don't need to be on Twitter. Um, but then as I was like trying to like find people to talk to about like job life stuff, um, I actually messaged a programmer on Instagram because I was like, hey. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, can I talk to you? And they're really nice. Uh, and I would say, like, even if like you're like, I'm not on Twitter, like, oh, I've already failed. It's like, no, it's not to like just start doing something now, and you'll eventually get there. You might make mistakes. You might like go some other way. But the important thing is, is to like try. Yeah. Yeah. And even playing off of like unconventional backgrounds, like, there's so much discourse, especially in art, about like, don't do fan art. Like, fan art won't get you a job. But that's so not true, like so many famous artists have gotten their foot in the door because of fan art, because they did really great piece, that was really awesome. Uh, there's an artist her name Claire Hummel, and she's actually the artist of nail pets, did not know that. Like, yeah, stuff I really looked at like all of her phenomenal and stuff, it's so cool. Yeah, like Firewatch, and she like works at Campbell Santa, and her stuff is just phenomenal, and she just made nail pets. She, like, she made nail pets the way that I remembered it, and like she just did that, and now makes really cool games. So you know, like, don't be afraid to find unconventional ways to get in. Um, it's, it's a totally valid way to see that. Like everyone mentioned, like I went to school for film and animation. Like I didn't know I wanted to do games. So you don't have to be classically trained. You don't have to go to these programs. Like you can just really want to do it and just do it. Like there's nothing that's stopping you. Like just start something and do something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just on the on the topic of making mistakes, right? Like so, there's a lot of things that end up happening because again, you're creating art. It's no one going to die on. You're all creating art. <laughs> uh, and like, don't be afraid to make mistakes. You have to make mistakes. That's totally normal, and that's part of the process. And if you're not making mistakes, that's when you, that's like cause for concern. You're like, wait, why am I too good at this? Uh, but also, like, just keep in mind, like, mistakes are kind of how you learn, right? Like, if you 
you got on a bike and you just rode it the first time and you're like, it's not a problem, like you might be an exceptional bike rider, but most people, it's gonna take them a couple tries and it's okay. Like take the training wheels. Take the training wheels are normal and, and it's part of the growing process. Um, I also think it's okay to like try different things. So if you're like, I don't really know what I wanna do, but I like, I like writing, I like art, and I like programming. Like do all three. You don't have to pigeonhole yourself into one thing. That's totally okay. Like, you have the opportunity when you're just starting out to make a lot of those mistakes because as you get further into your career, uh, those mistakes do get to be a little bit more. Uh, there's a little. There's how do I say this? Like, there's a little. There's a little bit more that happens once those mistakes are made. There's a little bit more at stake, mm -hmm. right? Versus just like I'm just like making a small game and it's not a big deal. Right? You're making a small game. It's not a big deal. Um, the other thing that I would say is. Uh, don't be afraid to put your stuff up, even if it's like, if you think it's bad. Because the thing is, like, I also think that there's this weird misperception in the game industry that it's like, unless you're this like huge name and have this huge game attached to you, it, it means that you're like not a creator. But the thing is, like, you never know what you're gonna put on the internet that like speaks to somebody. And I feel like that's more impactful than maybe like making a million dollar game or something like that. But it's, I mean, it's different for each person if that's your, if that's like your jam and you're like, I should make like that's fine um, but I think that like I think it's more impactful when someone says the thing that you made spoke to me like that's probably going to be a little bit more touching than anything else yeah and one last random take over this is uh, don't be scared to put unconventional stuff mm -hmm. either on your resume or telling people when you're in an interview you can put it under like volunteering like um, I volunteered to moderate um, in the uh, online IRC for a Twitch stream um, for a big charity event and for a bunch of years and I put that on my resume under volunteering and that was actually like pretty much the main experience that I used to get hired at Microsoft when I did. That's so awesome. it, I think it's really important to say like I've done this thing, I didn't get paid for it but it was still a lot of work and I still had to do it right mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important. Do you have any other final thoughts? Well, we have a few minutes if anyone wants to ask any questions in like five minutes. There's a mic right here if you want to step yeah. up. Also, if you're not comfortable asking a question in this setting, like I will never ask a question in this setting. Um, maybe <laughs> I'll ask it if you want to chat with me. I'm not doing anything yet. <laughs> Hi, thank you. <laughs> oh, there's a mic. I guess I should <laughs> use it. Is this on? Is it on? Uh, we can hear you even if it's yeah. not. We can repeat your question. It's okay. Oh, no. Yeah, whatever. Oh, 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 oh my god. Oh, oh, well, it works. Oh, I just flicked a switch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Flash is dying. Mm -hmm. End of life 2020. End of the year, yep. Right. Um, <laughs> how do y'all feel about that? Like, it's end of an era, good riddance, a little both? <laughs> I, I'll be honest. Like, I'm totally okay with it. I think that it served its purpose, and I think that there's a lot of great things that came from Flash, and I think that it's time for a new era, and it's okay. Yeah, I think for me, the, my biggest worry is more like the games I lost might go away, yeah. but there's a bunch of different organizations that are working to try to do a good archive of like, mm -hmm. really good stuff, so at least there's that. Yeah, the Impact is finally updating their site uh, yeah. sometime this year. Apparently it's going to be on mobile now, so. Does anyone know if Homestar Runner's getting Oh my, oh my god. Yeah, that's, that's, gone. that's the one that I'm going to be sad about. They're going to show on YouTube. 